he's on the brink of declaring all-out victory in this war. If there's anyone who gets to say mission accomplished right now, it's Bashar al-Assad. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Bremmer and welcome to your G Zero World. Lots going on right now this week we have for our big interview, Lara Satrakian, she's the founder of Syria Deeply. Important week to be talking to her. Uh, a new segment where I'm taking your questions. They were actually pretty darn good, got hundreds, pick three. See what you had to say, what I had to say to respond to you. And then of course, puppet regime Mark Zucker Puppet uh, is gonna be announcing something kind of interesting. But first, your world this week. Something a little different for your world this week. I, I have a book coming out. It's called Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. Um, and given the timeliness of the topic and the fact that it's coming out, um, I wanted to take you through uh, a little bit of it. Maybe start with the fact that this week we've been talking a lot about Jim Comey, uh, the uh, former director of the FBI. And the big news that he broke is that President Trump is morally unfit to be president. Can I tell you something? I think that we sort of understood moral capacity of the president when he was elected back a year and a half ago. Is Comey really suggesting we didn't? Or is he suggesting that all of the people that voted for him and the people that didn't bother to vote are also somehow morally suspect and that Comey knows better? I think that's what he's saying. And I think everyone that falls into those two camps probably are pretty angry about the way that Comey's saying that. Look. That's not what I'm talking about with us versus them. What I really want to talk about is that there's a much bigger issue, and instead of focusing on morality or not, we're not focusing on how it was the guy got elected. Perhaps more importantly, we're not focusing on President Emmanuel Macron, the French president is coming to the United States in just a few days, um, and he's said this week that Europe is facing a civil war. Uh, between the forces of democracy and the forces of liberalism. I've not heard anything like that in my lifetime from a major European leader. And if he was being honest, he'd probably say that there's a civil war in the United States too. Same kind of thing, us versus them, not the liberal democracy that we thought we had in both sides of the Atlantic. The book's about that. The book's about why, and there are four big reasons that I think are worth talking about a lot bigger than whether we love Trump or we hate him. Number one, economics. All of those forces of globalization were telling you that open trade, free trade, getting goods back and forth was what was going to drive global growth. And it did. Extraordinary numbers of people risen from poverty all over the world. But a lot of people lost their capacity. A lot of people lost their jobs in the United States, Europe, the developed world. And was there any investment in their backyards in terms of infrastructure, education, health care? Very little. As a consequence, the American dream doesn't feel like it used to, while the Chinese people feel their Chinese dream. Big reason why you have a lot of folks saying we're not so interested in globalism anymore. Number two, culture. Don't like free trade? How about open borders? How about the idea that uh, the United States or Europe is going to welcome everybody that's coming in, even if they don't sound like you, they don't talk like you? Sounds great when we have the Statue of Liberty and everyone's doing well, but when they're not doing so well, you think they might be taking some of your benefits, they might be competing with you, or God forbid, they might criminalize, they might engage in attacks against you, something we particularly see in Europe with large Muslim immigration that doesn't integrate very well from places like North Africa and the Middle East, leading a strong pushback uh, against the forces of globalism. Number three, security. If you're in the United States and you're an enlisted man or woman or a family of such, and you've been fighting in failed wars in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria. You give the ultimate sacrifice. You come back in pieces. You're not treated like a hero. Veterans Administration doesn't work for you. You're pretty angry at the idea that the United States should be the global policeman for everyone else. How about if they do their fighting and the United States stops? It's a really strong reason against the forces of globalism here in the US and abroad. And number four is technology. You think you were losing your jobs because they were going to some emerging market where they could do it cheaper like China or Mexico? How about a robot? How about automation? How about the fourth industrial revolution where even if the investment comes back to the developed world, there aren't many jobs to go with it. It's not like Google hires as many people as AT&T used to. We've got a jobless revolution happening in the United States right now and people are upset about it. 
That's another reason why they think that the forces of globalism, the shareholders are making an awful lot of money. How about them? And the other piece of technology, the social media, the filter bubble as we call it, where everyone's not watching the same news. It's fake news if you don't agree with it. You want to follow me, it means you must like me, right? Maybe not me, but just about everybody else. And if that's the way it's supposed to be, it means us versus them. It's tribal. Everyone else is someone we don't pay attention to, we don't care about. You put together those four things, economics, culture, security, and technology, all of which are doing very well for the top 1%, thank you very much. But if you're in the working or middle class in the developed world, you're getting angry. You're getting really willing to go after the establishment, their political figures, the business community, the bankers, the media in the mainstream, even the public intellectuals. That's only going to grow unless you fix the social contract not happening anytime soon. Until then, it's a lot more us versus them. We can talk about how much we love Trump, we hate Trump. We can talk about Brexit. We can talk about all of these leaders across Europe. But what we really should be discussing is why it is that they're all coming and why you're going to see a lot more of them in the near future. OK, that's enough of the questions from me. How about some questions from you? Let's go to office hours. So we'll do something a little bit different this week. We're going to take some questions from you, my loyal followers. Um, from Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. And uh, for those that uh, are being shown today, you're gonna get a signed copy of my new book, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. Uh, we'll see how it goes beyond that. Maybe we'll try it every week. Can't promise gonna be books, but let's get started. Hi Ian, which major power do you expect to benefit the most and the least from the decline of globalism? Look forward to reading your book. Thank you. Big winner has to be China, uh, because if uh, you know, sort of the Western formulation of liberal democracy, globalism, open borders, and the rest isn't working, the Chinese are the ones that want to write the checks, get their own standards, develop alternative architecture. That's not global. It's hub and spoke. It's a Beijing consensus. They're clearly the winners in that environment. Uh, the worse globalism does, uh, the better for the Chinese. Um, the losers are not the United States. The losers are a lot of American allies that really rely on the United States for driving uh, common Western standards on free trade and open borders. So it's Canada, Mexico, the Europeans, much smaller allies around the world. The United States uh, is not going to do so poorly uh, in the context of globalism. Good question. And now to Anat Alazari. She wants to know who are the key players that are responsible for the failure of globalism. Uh, it has to be the government. It has to be the politicians. I mean, you can certainly blame businesses for being complicit and media and public intellectuals and all the rest. But ultimately, it's the people that are elected that are in the positions of power. If they're standing by and not taking active decisions to make life better for the average citizen, for the middle and the working class, then they're the ones that are responsible. And that's true for both the establishment left and the establishment right here in the United States and across the developed world. And now our final question to Christian Albergo. Christian. Is the argument of this book in conflict with Pinker's Enlightenment, Enlightenment Now argument that unstoppable progress towards a globalized world is the way we are and should go? Look, I love Steven Pinker's work. I've read it for a long time, and I want to be optimistic about the future of humanity, that we're all coming together. This is, you know, we're meant to be, you know, sort of one common species. But the history of humanity doesn't tell you that. It tells you that we're tribal. It tells you that we fight, particularly when uh, we feel like others are doing better uh, than we do. I mean, think about the way we treat animals, right? I mean, we've pretended that they don't feel pain and they don't have consciousness, uh, even though we now know that they do because they're tasty. Um, and, you know, when I think about the future of human beings, I wasn't going to go quite there. But look, even if Pinker's right in 50 years, for the next 10 or the next 20, uh, we're going to be in an environment where we're going to build a lot more walls uh, and where we're going to dehumanize a lot of people uh, outside of our country and even inside. That, that's obviously the trend. Uh, and uh, I'm not willing to trust the technologists that they're going to get all this fixed for us. So thanks for that, all three. You're going to get books. We'll try this segment uh, you know, in future weeks, see how it goes. I love taking questions uh, from people and just kind of seeing what comes up. Uh, the questions tend to be really good, and there were a lot of them this week. So we'll keep it going. Uh, but for now, got your pup regime. Hey, folks. Ian here, and I'm delighted to have with me today Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. Now, first question I'd like to ask you is now that Facebook is basically a news platform. Uh, well, we're actually not a news platform, Ian. We're a... Uh, this is not a window. It's actually a portal that enables you to look out on your community. This isn't a sink. 
It's a place you go to interface with water. People are worried about privacy, Mark. They say that you and your company know too much about them. That that you've already pre-ordered 14,000 copies of your own new book. Well, thank you for saving me the trouble of doing my own shameless sales pitch. Us versus them. Us versus them. Us versus them. Us versus them. The whole Israel Iran thing is much more ratchetable yes. on the back of us ripping up the Iran deal than on the back of Syria. And I'm here today with Laura Satrakian. She is CEO and executive editor of News Deeply. Uh, also was the founder some six years ago of their flagship site, Syria Deeply. Of everyone I know in the West, the Syria war has probably had more of an impact on your career than anyone I can think of. So in 2011, I was the correspondent for ABC News and Bloomberg TV covering the Middle East. Yeah. It struck me then, it has, as it had struck me before, that media systems as they currently operate are ill-equipped to follow multiple unfolding crises. So I left uh, the TV job. I started an all-in-one platform called Syria Deeply. We assigned uh, specialized editors to cover the conflict and to maintain deep networks uh, of correspondence inside the ground. Right now, that's Alessandra Massi and Hashem Moseran. They're based in Beirut. And they do an incredible job of tracking the conflict every day and seeing the emerging threats and trends up ahead. So uh, let's start with the big news, which is the United States said they were going to bomb again, have bombed again. Russians aren't doing anything. A win, a loss, does it matter? How do you view it? Each side is living in its own reality and pushing its own storyline. And in this case, they don't match. The Russians say the Syrians swatted down some of those missiles. The US patently denies that. So it's very hard to tell from the rhetoric alone who had the upper hand. Does that make it more stable? Does it make it a forever war? I mean, if, if all sides can accomplish, if everyone can have prizes uh, in Syria, uh, then you know, sort of how long does that persist without any change? With this administration in the U.S. and the systems that we've seen in Syria, Iran, and Russia continuing on in, in the course of the conflict, it's fair to say that everyone does get a trophy to take home to their domestic constituency. But in terms of what's going to bring this war to a close or even alleviate a tiny bit of the suffering of the Syrian people, I don't see the stakeholders of the status quo doing anything differently. The U.S. says mission accomplished, but the U.S. also called for Assad to step down seven years ago. So what mission was accomplished? The narrow strike on some chemical weapons producing facilities in the middle of the night with no personnel, so basically no human capital lost on the Syrian side. You would argue that the Russians are now complicit, directly complicit in terms of supporting Assad's use of chemical weapons. It's hard to say. Even though Iran and Russia supported his strategies and have supported his regime, it's still not clear how much leverage they really have, how much direct participation in Assad's own policy making. So I don't think it's necessarily fair to say Russia is directly complicit in a particular strategy. We don't actually know. But systemically, they have, of course, stood behind him holistically. Uh, and so that, that has given him license and a lot of confidence that he can do basically whatever is necessary. The strategies he's used have been brutal but they've been very effective. And so they have ensured his political survival. He's on the brink of declaring all out victory in this war. If there's anyone who gets to say mission accomplished right now, it's Bashar al-Assad. Now we've talked a lot more in the United States about the Russians, because we care more about them, than the Iranians in terms of their role in Syria, on the ground in Syria. I is that appropriate? Iran has had a tremendous role, not only in maintaining Bashar al-Assad's position in Syria, but in expanding its footprint, military, commercial, and otherwise, over the course of this conflict, it has really expanded. I mean, it's by some counts, 60,000 troops, uh, Iran-backed. So both Iranians and Shiite militias or just Iran-backed militias on the ground. That's tremendous. Um, all reports I hear from Syria now, from Syrians themselves, Iran is buying up real estate. They're investing in redevelopment. They're even giving out humanitarian aid. Iran is playing this Syrian moment extremely well, and we really don't hear much about it. More so than the Russians, then. Iran and Russia have played the Syrian conflict to their maximum national gain, their maximum individual interests on the ground. For Russia, that's meant keeping Tartus, their warm water port, so their ships aren't stuck in ice some parts of the year. Um, and of course, some other political gains. For Iran, that has meant having this expanded footprint on Israel's doorstep, 
Um, and again, I don't think we should underestimate the value of this case study for Iran and Russia. They get to tell any of their allies and any future allies who come on board, look how effective we are at helping you when times are tough. With 2,000 American troops on the ground in Syria, um, do they have a mission? When it comes to the physical presence, 2,000 troops on the ground, as one vet told me recently, that means 5,000 contractors with those 2,000. So, so a real presence. It has fortified and achieved a lot of capacity building for the Syrian Democratic Forces, essentially the Kurdish-led coalition, which now controls a broad swath of territory in northern and eastern Syria, including the oil-producing regions. So, in a sense, that mission of the U.S. going in to support the Kurds as the tip of the spear against ISIS has worked. How does Assad then declare victory, as you suggested, given that the Kurds are doing so well? Assad doesn't really mind. Uh, regime forces withdrew from Kurdish areas pretty early on in the fight, in, in this overall war. So Assad doesn't seem particularly bothered by Kurdish autonomy at this moment, at least. Turkey, on the other Turkey hand, does. is plenty pissed. But the idea that Kurds are operating, that, that hasn't been particularly bothersome to the Assad regime. How dangerous? in reality, do you think it is? Where are the fault lines where this could get a lot bigger, a lot worse? So not only do you have nation states and dozens of armed militia groups on the ground, but you have irregular forces from nation states. Like I said, Iran-backed militias, Russian contractors. It's an insane soup of fighting forces in Syria right now. The fault line that is most likely to escalate is Iran to Israel. The status quo this moment involves Iran having a very significant capability set in Syria on Israel's border. The U.S. doesn't seem to mind in the sense that there's no U.S. pushback on that aspect of the conflict, but there has been Israeli pushback, and we don't know what that's going to look like going forward. The Russians and Iranians haven't done much um, to respond when the Israelis have engaged in strikes. This is an asymmetric conflict of global proportions. It's not in the interests of Iran and Russia to escalate in a way where it becomes a conventional military uh, confrontation. So if there's an occasional loss of life here or there on striking a base or striking some empty buildings in the middle of the night, I don't think that's particularly problematic for them. Would you say the same thing about Turkey? One of the great uh, successes, I think, of the Russian-Iranian bloc in this conflict has been functionally pulling Turkey away from NATO. You have a photo of the Iranian, Russian, and Turkish presidents in Ankara as if it were like a team huddle on a baseball field. And yet Erdogan quite quickly publicly supported the strikes by the United States, France, and the UK. Turkey has played a dual role throughout this. Uh, they've, they've been very strategically flexible. But for the million-plus refugees in their country uh, and uh, no real clear strategy for how to integrate them or, or handle that burden, I think that they've actually done pretty well out of this conflict. What are the lessons as a consequence of the last seven years? I've learned three big lessons from this war. The first is that the U.S. is being definitively outwitted by Russia and Iran. There's a strategic gap between U.S. capabilities and Russian and Iranian capabilities. The second lesson is that the norms and laws that have governed modern military engagement, so the rules of war as we've known them, are completely defunct. And we're going to have to come up with new ones or find new ways to enforce the old ones. Otherwise, we should expect that this is what war will look like going forward. Um, and the third is that global governance itself is broken. The mechanics of de-escalation no longer exist, if they ever did. Whether it's a paralyzed Security Council or uh, a lack of enforcement of agreed upon deals, like the 2013 chemical weapons deal between the US and Russia, these are things no one is willing to enforce right now. There's a lack of political will at a global level to step in and do what would truly be necessary in, in order to pull this uh, conflict apart and, and really resolve it. All the countries engaged in Syria, the U.S. has, in a sense, given up the least mm -hmm. in terms of what it's done. Is that, why, why, is that the, why does that necessarily mean that the Americans are having circles run around them by everybody else? So if the U.S. said at the outset of the Syrian conflict, our goal is to spend the minimum dollar amount on this conflict, you could say, OK. Trump is kind of saying that, right? In retrospect. That's different than having had a strategy to begin with. But no, Trump has kept it contained. He, he has been clear up front. The U.S. under Obama 
was much more of a wayward voice in the Syrian conflict. Uh, under the Obama administration, the president himself didn't seem to take the advice of people in his own government who knew Syria well. Ambassador Robert Ford, the last serving U.S. diplomat mm -hmm. uh, in Syria, Fred Hoff, former advisor. Though these guys saw all of this coming, and Obama sort of willfully ignored them. I think that there's a lot to be said about the failures. I, I'd give, at best, the Obama administration a D minus for its Syria policy. If the United States president were to articulate a proactive strategy, an interventionist strategy, whatever that means for Syria, that would work, in your view, what is it? The best thing the U.S. could do for its own interests right now is minimize the space for radical groups to continue to operate in Syria, uh, minimize the risk of radicalization of millions of Syrians living in desperate conditions in neighboring countries, five million, inside the country, six million, if you're just from the displaced. So you have 11 million very unhappy Syrians living in terrible conditions. That has the capacity to create a lot of problems 20, 30 years down the line. You talk to a lot of Syrians. What do they tell you that people don't understand? There are consequences of this war that are not being accounted for around the world. And that includes, what does it mean that at this point, war crimes are used lightly and strategically? I mean, what does it mean that you can push that many people out of their homes and over the borders into another country. I mean, this is a this is given a, a, a case study, a, a perfect to-do list for any authorita authoritarian government that wants to maintain power at any cost. You, you think of that statement, what it means to maintain power at any cost, the Syrians now know very personally that cost. And so this can happen anywhere in the world now. But if you ask Syrians who support Bashar al-Assad, how they feel about this moment, mm. they're on the brink of victory. They're very relieved that in some ways order has been restored. Before we go, give the audience a little hope. What's a silver lining we can look at? I've been continually inspired by the resilience and resolve of individual Syrians doing things that whatever they need to do to survive, to educate their children. It's dire, but the individual Syrian entrepreneurs, or the women setting up schools in their basement when kids can't get to the schoolhouse. Uh, the whole evolution of what they call siege medicine. How do you take care of people, whether it's a diabetic or a war wound, when no medical supplies are getting in? There have been incredible acts of invention and innovation. Um, and so I have had a great feel, a great privilege of witnessing that in action. A lot of talent in this part of the world. That's not going to change anytime soon. Lars Trekin, good to be with you. Thank you. Okay, that's your show this week. Come back next week. We've got Mary Louise Kelly. She is the co-host of National Public Radio's All Things Considered. You've heard her. You'll see her next week.